Is it possible to be an addict and not know it? Stay tuned because that's what we're going to be talking about in today's episode. If you're new to the channel or haven't yet had a chance to join this community all about emotional and financial well-being, do that now before we get started. Just click the little red subscribe button and the bell beside it to be notified every time we release a new video. There's always been such a stigma surrounding addiction, but I think as we take a closer look today, we're going to realize that addiction isn't what we always believed it to be. And in fact, a lot more of us are addicts than touted by the mainstream narrative. We are a highly addictive culture, but up to this point, we've managed to scapegoat addiction onto a few of the more extreme types of addicts like heroin, LSD, and meth addicts probably to make mainstream society feel better about the addictions that we struggle with. Work, getting packages in the mail from Amazon, fitness, politics, social media, religion, money, success, sex, love, fame, celebrity, you name it. When really, all of those addictions have the same basic root causes. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later in the video. Addiction is a complex process involving the psyche, the brain, and the body, and is manifested in any behavior that a person finds temporary pleasure or relief in in the short term. But one that has negative consequences and also is signified by having trouble with or refusal toward giving it up. Other examples of socially acceptable behavior that can turn into addictions are tobacco use, smoking, television, alcohol, extreme sports, porn, entertainment, socializing, eating, internet use, news junkie, chronic pharmaceutical use, and so on. So it's important to ask ourselves, not so much am I an addict, because most of us are, but what am I addicted to? It seems like only hardcore drug addiction is discussed in our culture, and that's partially due to the fact that it's related to deaths and also because of its illegality. But what we need to realize is an addiction in and of itself is a normal response to the unhealthy and dysfunctional environment a person was raised in. In other words, addiction expresses something about people's lives and the greater society that we live in. Addiction is not a genetic tendency, nor is it a disease that suddenly strikes us. It's a coping mechanism that tends to run in families or societies, again, not genetically, but environmentally. Addiction is merely pain relief. Stigmatized pain relief, but pain relief all the same. A workaholic and a shopaholic are trying to excite and release the same brain chemicals as a drug user in order to cover up the pain, underlying feelings that seem too difficult to tolerate in that moment. And we don't even need to ask why the pain relief because why the pain is the real question. And the answer always lies in a person's childhood. Addiction is just the end process caused by suffering in the earliest years of life. When a person tries a drug or other addictive behavior for the first time, and this often happens in the teen years, they get this feeling of calm and relief that they've never experienced before in their life. And from that moment on, they're hooked. Some addictions begin even earlier than that. I remember being addicted to relationships from the time I was eight. I would say I was a codependent, maybe even younger. Dr. Gabor Mate says that of all the female substance addicts that he worked with in a downtown clinic for several years, every single one of them had been sexually abused as a child. He found zero exceptions to that in all the years that he worked there. So most of us are addicts of one sort or another, all with unfulfilled emotional connection and attachment. People are empty inside, devoid of intrinsic peace, contentment, and belonging. We have stress instead of peace. We have loneliness and abandonment and rejection instead of belonging. And we have strife and anxiety instead of contentment. Science has shown that no one is born an addict. However, if a animal or human mother experiences stress during the pregnancy, her offspring is born with addictive tendencies. But what causes the person to go from mere tendency to becoming an addict? The majority of substance addicts were abused in childhood. But what about all the other types of addicts? Almost without exception, an addict was surrounded by stress in their childhood environments. Studies have shown that stress can be passed down through the male reproduction of our ancestors, but it's also transferred through the behaviors and the relationships that they had with us when we were a child. For example, if my grandfather was an angry man, my mother likely grew up being afraid of anger. So if I got angry at one and a half years old, my mother wasn't able to emotionally handle it. And her reaction to my anger taught me to suppress it in order to maintain attachment with her. 
And that's just one scenario. There are so many examples like that. Addicts learn in childhood that in order to maintain attachment, they have to ignore their gut feelings and needs. So they lose connection with their true selves early on, their authenticity. So how do ACEs or adverse childhood experiences come into play? Well, the original test was conducted in the 90s and it found that a person with significant ACEs was 4,600% more likely to become a substance user than someone with zero ACEs. And zero ACEs is not common. For every ACE a person has, the number increases. And they only used the 10 most common ACEs to get to this statistic. As I mentioned in several of my other videos, there are dozens of types of ACEs. Just because you didn't have one of the top 10 or most common, doesn't mean you had a rosy childhood. A few examples of the ACEs that are not on the official test are poverty, adoption, foster care, violence prone or low income neighborhoods, house fires, accidents, etc. I'm gonna be talking more about those in next week's videos, so make sure you're tuned in. But basically, the early experiences we have shape the brain's development, structurally, neurologically, and chemically. Even the brain circuits themselves are developed according to the environments that we grew up in. So the solution for addiction is not abstinence or rehab. It's trauma-informed therapy because it's the pain from childhood that is driving a person to self-medicate with substances or work or shopping or whatever the drug of choice is. Trauma-informed therapy gets to the root of the problem, the pain itself. Once that is resolved, a person won't have a need to soothe it any longer. I talked more about trauma-informed therapy in my recovery series, so I'll put a link in the description at the end of the video so you can go back and watch it if you'd like to. Recovery from addiction is possible, but it's necessary to use the proper approaches, otherwise the addict will relapse time and time again. Think about the vicious dieting cycle. A person abstains from food for as long as they possibly can or for this set period of time, but as soon as the diet's over, they gain the weight right back. That is an example of an addict relapsing over and over again. And that's because the emotional pain and emptiness that causes that person to overeat is still there. None of us wants to live in constant pain, so it's a natural response to try to self-medicate, even if it's just for momentary relief. So this opens up new meaning to the term getting a fix. Getting my fix should be called soothing my pain. As humans, we crave comfort and relief from pain. So addiction becomes not so much a choice, but a matter of survival. And none of this is said to condone addiction. It's said to shed light on the solution, to give the addict hope that there is a way to recover. The longer an addict uses, the more brain damage occurs. And then the damaged brain has to find a way to choose to heal. So I'm not trying to say it's an easy thing to recover from addiction, but that it is possible. Obviously, the younger a person is, the easier it is. Compassion is an extremely important part of the process, especially from the addict's supporting cast, those he or she is closest to. When compassion is present, it allows the person to see the truth and come to a place where he or she feels safe enough to consider entering trauma-informed therapy. At the end of the day, childhood trauma is what leads to addiction, whether it be attachment trauma, emotional neglect, physical abuse, or violence in the home, or something else. And addiction almost always brings along with it shame and dishonest behavior because we feel like we have to hide it. So why is that? Why are normal adaptive behaviors so highly criticized in our society? I think it comes down to what I just mentioned, shame. No one feels comfortable exposing the shame that they carry around with them, nor the behaviors that they use to medicate, whether that be alcohol, work, shopping, or overeating. So it's easier to point the finger at people addicted to illegal drugs and call them the addicts so that we don't have to confront how we self-medicate. But as we've discussed today, it all comes from the same place, childhood wounds. After hearing addiction presented in this different light today, it may have caused you to want to start your own journey of recovery or at least do some more research so that medicating and managing pain is no longer necessary so that you can be free of the past once and for all. If that's you, I'm going to be putting links to several resources in the description to help you get started because many times that's the hard part, just knowing where to start. And finally, some of you might be wondering, how do I know if a behavior is an addiction? Well, all you have to do is use the definition I gave earlier for addiction to ask yourself. So let's take Amazon shopping for an example. So does it bring you momentary pleasure or relief? Yes. 
Does it cause you negative consequences? Like making my husband upset that I spent too much money or not being able to pay off all my bills this month? Yes. And is it tough for me to give up or let go of this habit? Yes. So if, if it fits, and that was just a fun example, but if it fits all the criteria of that definition I gave earlier, it's probably an addiction. And it's not to focus on the fact that, oh, I have an addiction, but to say, what is underneath that addiction? Why am I trying to bring myself relief? Is there pain there that I'm trying to kind of cover up by shopping and making myself have that, that moment of pleasure? And if it is, deeper discovery is needed possibly even trauma-informed therapy to get to the root of some of the things that you may have experienced growing up. Hopefully you found the information we covered today useful. And if you did, please consider giving the video a like or leaving a comment below to help others find it. And also feel free to comment if you have a question or I left something hanging or didn't explain something fully. I'd also love to connect with you on social media, so feel free to message or comment on my Facebook page, Leah Theobald. I'll put a link in the description so it's easier to find. In the next video, I'm gonna be talking about some of the ACEs that aren't on the official ACE test. I get a lot of questions about adverse experiences that affected people but weren't included in the top 10 on the test. So if you don't want to miss that, make sure that you're subscribed and that your notifications are turned on. Thank you for watching today. See you in the next video. Bye.